average one third of our lives asleep. We know we need to sleep, but most of us have never really given a whole lot of thought as to why we sleep. Why do we spend seven or eight hours a night immobile and unconscious? What really happens inside our brains and bodies while we're sleeping? It's one of the biggest unanswered questions in all of science which is why researchers across the country are doing studies and coming up with some new, intriguing discoveries. We don't sleep just to rest our tired bodies? Well, that's been one of the long-standing theories, but I think what we're starting to understand is that sleep serves a whole constellation of functions, plural. One thing that's clear, says Matthew Walker, director yeah. of the Sleep yeah. and Neuroimaging Lab at the University of California, yeah. Berkeley, right. is yeah. sleep is critical. In a series of studies done back in the 1980s, rats were kept awake indefinitely. After just five days, they started dying. From sleep deprivation. From sleep deprivation. And in fact, sleep is as essential as food because they, they will die just about as quick from food deprivation as sleep deprivation. So it's that, it's that necessary. And it's not just rats. Every animal studied so far needs sleep, from the elephant right down to the fruit fly. But that's as far as the similarities go. Some animals sleep 20 hours a day, others just two or three, and still others sleep with half their brains at a time, all making it hard to figure out what exactly it is about sleep that makes it so essential, and that in terms of evolution, makes it worth the risks. You wonder why we develop this if survival is the whole point, because you're completely vulnerable when you're lying there. Whatever the function of sleep or the functions of sleep are, they seem to be so important that evolution is willing to put us in that place of potential danger by losing consciousness. It would be the biggest evolutionary mistake if sleep does not serve some critical function. You will ebb and flow throughout these kind of next 15 hours. One of the most exciting new discoveries involves learning and memory. How many hours I'm counting till I go to sleep now? These five college students are subjects in one of Walker's studies, and they've been awake now for more than 24 hours. He has found that students like these do 40% worse memorizing lists of words after a night without sleep. But he has discovered something far more revolutionary about what happens when we do sleep. Sleep, we, we've been finding, actually can enhance your memories so that you will come back the next day even better than where you were the day before. So if I'm having this conversation with you, yep. and of course I'm going to remember it I'd in hope. 10 minutes, but you're saying if I get a good night's sleep tonight... I'll remember it even better tomorrow than I do later today? That's what we've been finding. To prove it, he put me through a test he's given more than 400 study subjects. I had to type a series of numbers, 4, 1, 3, 2, 4, over and over again with my left hand, making a new physical memory. It's hard. It's not as easy as you think, is it? It gets harder. Oops. Some of Walker's subjects learn this sequence in the morning, then were tested 12 hours later to see how well they had learned. Their performance remained essentially the same. But others learned it late in the day, then were retested after a night of sleep. Their performance and mine actually got better by at least 20 to 30 percent. So it proves that the sleep enhanced the memory. So it seems to be that, yeah, yeah. practice does not quite make perfect. It's practice with a night of sleep that makes perfect. Like Who so. didn't spend all college staying up all night to study for a test? Everybody does that. It's this odd notion that we all think in Western civilization that we have to stay awake to get more done. And I think that's simply not true. In fact, I think if you have a good night of sleep, what you'll find is that you can get more done than if you simply stay awake. But what if you do sleep, just not enough? All right, it's time to wake up. That's the focus of this NIH-funded study at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine, where four paid volunteers get wired up with electrodes and spend a week and a half sequestered in a dimly lit hospital suite. They have to stay awake till four in the morning, then are woken up at eight for five nights in a row. And then they're given tests to measure the effects of what's called chronic partial sleep deprivation. David Dinges is the scientist in charge. So what are you finding? What 
kind of effect does just four hours a night have? Well, the first finding, and it stunned us, was there's a cumulative impairment that develops in your ability to think fast, to react quickly, to remember things, and it starts right away. You mean the first night? A single one... night at four hours or five hours or even six can, in most people, begin to show effects in your attention and your memory and the speed with which you think. A second night, it gets worse. A third night, worse. Each day adds an additional burden or deficit to your cognitive ability. I'm, I'm stunned by you saying one night of just four or five hours sleep and you, you, your ability to function is already hurt. But remember, we're not allowing caffeine and we're not allowing physical activity and bright light. And for most of us, probably a day or two or so, you can get by taking these, what we call the countermeasures, right? But at some point, what these studies show is the impairments get so bad that there's little to no rescue possible without getting more sleep. It's hard to keep my eyes open, like, really. Dinges told us that his subjects, <laughs> like this young French woman, Hasina, get to where it seems like they're moving through molasses. So overall, how do you think not having enough sleep for five nights has affected you? <clears throat> well, um, my, I'm, I'm quiet, quieter, definitely, um, and, um, uh, what else did you would, want? would you say that overall your comprehension has been affected? Yeah, a little bit. The testing for alertness and reaction time has real-world relevance. Virginia Tech's Transportation Institute did a study of what causes car crashes. They got 241 volunteers to agree to have their cars wired with five cameras each. Over a year's time, they found that driving drowsy, as this man did, was the riskiest behavior of all. You only need two seconds to have a lapse in driving a car at 60 miles an hour to drift completely out of lane. Two so, seconds. Two seconds. You're off the road in four seconds. And, and those kinds of lapses and slowed reaction times begin to appear fairly early. The lapses are called micro-sleeps and can even occur when people have their eyes open. What about just turning up the radio, opening the window, lowering the temperature? Studies show that all of that stuff people tend to do, slapping themselves in the face, rolling the window down, radio up, singing. They're convinced it helps, but it's only a matter of seconds or minutes, and you can have a sudden sleep attack right in the midst of doing that. And it's not just driving. Dinges has examined, sometimes as an expert witness, the role of inadequate sleep in some of the world's most well-known accidents. You tell me if you think that sleep was a factor. Exxon Valdez, the oil spill. I, I do think it was a factor. Chernobyl. Uh, there is some evidence it was a factor. Three Mile Island. Yes, it occurred on the night shift, and we believe it was a factor. Staten Island Ferry. Definitely. Wow. We checked. The Exxon Valdez spill happened after midnight with a man at the helm who'd slept only four hours the night before. Chernobyl and Three Mile Island also occurred late at night and involved human error and the assistant captain who crashed the Staten Island ferry into a pier, killing 11, admitted that he felt exhausted before the accident. Many people want something associated with morals or management, or et cetera. Or alcohol, that's alcohol. what you keep assuming. Those are far more glamorous, but in reality, the, many of these disasters involve ju poor judgments and slowed reactions at a time when people were basically tired and made not complicated mistakes, simple ones. And that's, that is the hallmark of sleep deprivation. What if right now we went downstairs and I asked you to drive me somewhere? How do you think your reflexes are? Well, not that sharp, but maybe I'll be able to drive. <laughs> you know, you're very slow to answer my questions, and yet you still think you could drive. Well, yeah. I think so. What really struck me is that she didn't know how impaired she was. It was clear, but she didn't know. That has been a finding in all of our studies to date. They tell you they've adapted, they're okay. Dinges says people who are chronically sleep deprived, like people who have had too much to drink, often have no sense of their limitations. 
They believe they have trained themselves. I think it's a convenient belief for the millions of people who don't get enough sleep because their commute to work is too long or they spend too many hours at work or they just want this lifestyle of go, go, go. Um, it's convenient to say, I've learned to live without sleep. But you bring people into the laboratory, and we have an open challenge to any CEO or anyone in the world come into the laboratory. We don't see this adaptation. One thing sleep researchers do see is that their sleep-deprived volunteers often have mood swings. They get short-tempered. Okay. No need to chuck the little finger. It was no chucking. <laughs> then become almost giddy, sometimes within seconds. Matthew Walker devised a study to look at what was going on inside their brains. We took a group of young uh, college undergraduates and we deprived them of sleep for about 35 hours straight. And then we placed them inside an MRI scanner and we showed them increasingly negative and disturbing images. In fact, some of the images that we showed were even more disturbing than this, such as um, mutilations or oh. horrific accidents. And what we found was that in those people who had had a good night of sleep, the control group, mm -hmm. they showed a nice, modest, controlled response in the emotional centers of the brain. To orient you here, a region that we call the amygdala, left and right. And we can actually take a snapshot within that region. So this brain had a good night's sleep. But when we looked in the sleep-deprived subjects, instead what we found was a hyperactive brain response. It's right? like it's on fire. So it tells us that that emotional brain center was reacting far more strongly hmm. to those negative images. And what's more, in the sleep-deprived subjects, Walker discovered a disconnect between that overreacting amygdala and the brain's frontal lobe, the region that controls rational thought and decision-making, meaning that the subject's emotional responses were not being kept in check by the more logical seat of reasoning, a problem also found in people with psychiatric disorders. So you're saying that you take someone with a severe mental disorder and a person without that disorder but deprive them of sleep and the brain scan will look similar? The pattern of brain activity was not dissimilar. So I think what it forces us to do really now is to appreciate more significantly the role that sleep may be playing in mental health and in psychiatric diseases. And I think that that could be one of the futures of the field of sleep research. Walker says most of us need seven and a half to eight hours of sleep every night. And if we don't get it, as you'll see when we come back, you could end up fat and sick. 60 Minutes. We're always on cbsnews.com, sponsored in part by... Th By almost all measures, we're sleeping less than ever before. In 1960, a survey by the American Cancer Society asked one million Americans how much sleep they were getting a night. The median answer was eight hours. Today, that number has fallen to 6.7, a decrease of more than 15 percent in less than a lifetime. And what the scientists we met are finding is that we may be putting ourselves in a perilous situation. So when we are asleep, Ev Van Cotter, an endocrinologist,